All right. Well, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, and forgive me if I'm a little off kilter. Uh, I had surgery three weeks ago, so I'm still healing. So um, yeah, so the big E. So as um, Phil mentioned that uh, we've got um, a 16-day event that comes up in September, usually wraps up the first uh, week or weekend in October. Um, it's a huge event. And this is something that uh, has been around pretty much since 1916. It started off as a small agricultural event, and um, it's in West Springfield, and it hasn't moved from that location since. But this thing has grown to a 17-day event at the same location with multiple buildings involved. This thing is huge. So it features a carnival, lots of food vendors. I mean, you're talking over 150 food vendors, and I'm still trying to figure out the concept of fried Kool-Aid. Oh. I looked at that, and it's like, okay, I don't, I don't even want to know what that is. I think it's just a lab experiment. But, uh, yeah, they have lots of food. Uh, there's farm equipment. There's home improvement. I mean, they got one big, humongous display there. Nothing but hot tubs. Um, livestock shows. I mean, there's something for everyone. There's a carnival, um, everything. So somewhere in the late 80s and 90s, um, the Connecticut section, led by Betsy, K K K1EIC, actually was doing an annual booth there at the Big E in the Massachusetts building. And as time progressed, that uh, kind of faded away. Um, there was, you know, a number of complaints that kind of put people off. They said it was too noisy. They couldn't do this. They couldn't do that. All that type of stuff. So it just kind of went by the wayside. So in 2021, uh, Larry Cranston, W1AST, he's the president of the Hamden County Club uh, out in the um, Holyoke area. Um, and as you can see, he's on the right. The Steve Goodgame who's the uh, educational manager for the league. Um, but Larry got the inspiration because he was looking at the numbers. And the numbers there were basically over a million and a half people visited this event in 2021. And his thought was, if I just got 1% or one-tenth of 1% just to get interested in ham radio from this event, how many people would that really get as far as new hands? It actually was over a grand, a thousand people. So that got his wheels spinning. So he started checking into things. Now, Larry is a um, self-employed computer technician, IT type per, uh, guy. So he gets around. So one of those clients is actually a um, uh, works for the Eastern States. And he, they got to talk, and, and basically, Larry was offered a booth space. And this booth space has a value of about $4,000. We got it for nothing. So with that in hand, let the project begin. Now, keep in mind, the Big E is in uh, September. And we started this project about February previous to that. So it was n nearly a year's work. So we got the word out, and we got a committee together, and we had a bunch of Zoom sessions with a, a number of people um, throughout the New England area, New Hampshire, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, uh, New Vermont and New Hampshire, and Maine really didn't get involved much. But... Um, we took and uh, we started coming up with ideas, and we were bouncing all kinds of ideas as to what to do there, because we wanted to make it interesting. We wanted to make it interactive. Uh, we wanted to promote amateur radio at its finest. So now we got one person entering the picture, and that was Fred, AB1OC, our benevolent director. Well, he is also 
a member of Aris. And his thought was, why don't we get an Aris space station contact out there? And it's like, okay, here we go. Um, but yeah, they pitched the idea to Gene Cassidy, who's the chief executive of Eastern States, and he loved that idea. Because one of the things that Gene was trying to do is he was trying to add a little more variety to the Big E, you know, instead of, uh, you know, picking up cow flops and, uh, all, and all that other stuff there. He wanted to get something else going. So basically Gene, I think he opened up his wallet and emptied it out because not only did he take and provide us with the free boot space, but he also gave us the main stage to have our Aris contact. And on top of that, Black Helicopter, uh, that's actually an independent company, but Black Helicopter LLC, that's a daughter and father operation. They do a lot of video uh, work for ESPN. They said, hey, count us in, we'll help. So now we got a video production company. And also, Gene Cassidy also donated his stage production crew. So now, you know, all the furnishings, uh, all the, uh, the, 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 the hookups and everything to provide the, the sound and the uh, uh, screen uh, video to the stage. Free. You couldn't ask for anything better than that. So what the Aris also needed was they also needed, they also need a, um, a school sponsor for this because there's a, a specific program involved. So New England SciTech came on board. Bob Finney uh, jumped at the opportunity and uh, he came up with a, a STEM program. The STEM program is part of the ARIS requirement that they have to have a STEM program that goes throughout a year. So he got that all put together. So and if anybody has worked with Aris in the space station contact, you know that that's usually about a year at least to get that in motion. That's under normal conditions. Throw in COVID policies on top of that. That was fun. So, of course, one of the challenges was finance. You know, we started this basically on a word now we're sitting there, we got a booth, we got all this. What are we going to do for money? So Larry had somebody take and write up a grant, and we wound up with an ACE ARDC grant. I think it's in the neighborhood of $10,000. So now we got money. So now that we got money, now we need to put stuff together. And we still needed to, you know, be careful about things because the bulk of the money really needed to be as an incentive to have clubs and people take the drive out to Springfield and have them man these boots. And manning these boots is usually a minimum of a six-hour shift. And in some cases, people have done more. So... Let me just show you a few things, and I'll get a little more into it. But this front counter, this backdrop here, and that table right there, that would have been about a six or a $7,000 uh, purchase at a commercial um, display vendor. I built all those three for less than a grand. So... My summer was very busy in my garage, putting that stuff together. And one of the other challenges is, is that we needed to take and have it in such a way that it's, we could store it with minimal space. So all this stuff there can be broken down. So it worked out quite well. So that left us a lot of money that we could take and we could purchase other things for it. Um, you know, you can see that there's a tower there. There's the tower here, and I put a strobe light on there. There's a six-meter antenna um, that I brought in to uh, display it, which it wasn't connected to anything. It was just spinning around to try to attract people. 
But still, this, these are all things that we were just bringing in. Uh, the little plastic display case uh, had some um, kits uh, built. One of the other guys right here built some uh, homemade code oscillators, some of which out of tongue depressors and all kinds of cool things. The kids love those. So here's part of the progress. And as you can see, we we're all all busy getting together here. This is the day before the uh, official opening. And, you know, the place is just going nuts. Everybody's got their pallets and stuff in there. They're, they're all doing things. they got their cars. That's my trailer and my truck. Try to worm that darn thing in there with all that going on. That was a, that was a trip. Um, but yeah, I have my trailer. I loaded it up with all the, uh, all the booth stuff and I did manage to snake it back there so we can get it all, um, unloaded and set up. But as you can see, we had quite a crew over there to set it up. And, um, yeah, we did have a, uh, uh, we did have a radio. I can't think of the, it was a D-Star radio. I think it's the 9700, something like that. But we had a couple of D-Stars there. And um, we actually had um, Remote Ham Radio. Remote Ham Radio donated their time for us to um, operate a remote setup there for a special event station. So all kinds of neat stuff right there. Yep, and we, with all that, we still have a space station contact. And that was the actual stage that the, uh, the event was, good, was to take place. That had a seating capacity of about five, 6,000 people. Boy, we would have loved to have had that filled. But, and, and, I'll tell, and I'll tell you in a little bit, there was quite the learning curve on this one. Um, but yeah, we had to go out there. And not only was I involved with building all the uh, furnishings, and putting things together for the booth. I was also the production coordinator for uh, for the uh, space station, just to make sure that all the connections were made, the people were in place, you know, all the stuff that we needed to make things happen, activate the telebridge. I was in the uh, tent uh, doing the teleprompter. Yeah, I was a busy boy. So, yep. This was, well, of course, that's the stage. And, of course, there's Steve Goodgame. There's uh, Fred. That's me. That's Phil Temples, K9HI. And, of course, there's Mr. Dave Minster. This was taken the day of the uh, contact. We had uh, Dave Minster come up and do a uh, um, guest, uh, guest shot there. And he was quite impressed with what was going on. This was part of the production crew. That's me doing the teleprompter. That's father, that's daughter, that's black helicopter, and that's the production crew uh, for Eastern States. And for the life of me, I can't remember the darn company's name. So, yeah, as I said earlier, the Aris contact can take nearly a year. Uh, we need to satisfy a whole bunch of requirements. And then we had to figure out the time frame. Now, this is one of the things that differed from all the uh, ARIS contacts from the schools is that the, um, you know, the schools, you know, basically you ring a bell, all the kids come to the auditorium, sit down, and that's it. Away you go. This ain't the case. We basically had to figure out, you know, the, an exact time and place that this event's going to happen. So we couldn't guarantee that this thing was going to take and go right over us, over America, uh, the particular path that we chose and they accepted was over Belgium, over Europe. So it kind of got away from uh, doing a live antenna contact, so we used the telebridge. And the way the telebridge worked was we had to make a phone call to a specific operator and the operator in Belgium had to make us that same call. They link us up, and it was a pretty solid link that didn't drop. And, of course, we had to do all the testing and all that, so we had to hook them up. 
But, um, but yeah, we that's the Tell Bridge. So anybody on the stage would talk. When they talk, that just goes right through the system, right up to the uh, the astronaut who had the questions in place already with the questions or the answers already there because obviously we only had like a, about a 10 minute window. So we had to have all that all taken care of. And on this side here, you got Bob Finney. Uh, he's the director of New England SciTech, Fred. And this gentleman with the sport code is uh, Gene Cassidy, the CEO. And of course, Dave Minster, who uh, would rather have his nose in the cell phone. Great. What, what local time was the contact? What time was the um, I think it's what a five-hour difference. I think it's a five-hour difference. Our contact was two twenty-ish in the afternoon. So that's like early evening. Yep. So, yeah, this was, uh, you know, very, like, again, it was very unique. Um, and part of the program, you know, Fred wanted me to take and have the program and the, um, the whole um, stage event done in a certain way. Unfortunately, it didn't play out the way it wanted to. Um, they put on the advertising that this was going to start at 1.20 in the afternoon. Which, in a sense, yes, but we wanted to have something going on at some time prior to that. But they advertised it, so we had people coming in. And the stages were filling up pretty darn good. But then they realized, oh, it's going to be another 45 minutes. It's going to be another half hour before the event. Well, they got carnival and fried Kool-Aid and all that they wanted to take advantage of. So they basically got up and left. Some did come back. And some didn't. So the one thing that we did learn is that if we're going to do this again, it has to be, you know, like 10 minutes before the contact. You know, and everything else is just, you know, noise. It's just to attract people. So, yeah. And, and it was so critical that we had to put all this together without any hiccups. Basically, we put on a concert. So, as you can see, here's the teleprompter, and you can see how uh, all I was doing was just scrolling it up and down, and uh, she was working the, uh, the video content, feeding these two guys so that they could get it out to the screen. Up there in the corner, that's the Telbridge uh, setup, which really isn't really attractive, but microphone cords, telephone, and all that good stuff, and a couple of other doodads. This was an actual uh, um, location at, uh, what was it, 2.35 in the afternoon, and that was its present location at that time. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what it was was that a couple of weeks prior, and this is the other thing, too, is that NASA wasn't going to give us any type of time frames outside of a couple of weeks. It was basically two weeks prior. And then they gave us this, this list. And we had to take and figure out which one was going to work best for us. And depending on the location, the time, and where they were, was going to determine how long of a um, contact we were going to have with them. So, yeah, so there were a few boo-boos. You know, there was a couple things that I, I need to tweak on my uh, on the booth setup, um, the space station contact. You know, yeah, we need to keep the people there. So we have to take and get ourselves out of the school mentality over to, uh, you know, a concert-type mentality. Um, the floor plan could, could have been better to attract visitors. Basically, we had a perimeter of stuff around there. And 
there was enough space in the middle that you could hold a dance in. Uh, there was quite a bit of space there, and, you know, we just mentioned that, hey, you know, we could do something better with it. Um, we'd love to see some kind of an antenna. We need to talk to them about that to try to get some kind of an HF antenna outside. If anything, just for listening purposes. I'd like to do tra something with the transmitting, but we got to see what, they are because basically the building that we're in, which is the uh, Better Living Center, um, if you know those buildings, yeah, you got a big Faraday cage there. Yeah, you ain't gonna transmit nothing out there. So, and of course, if we put up an antenna, then we've got to worry about, you know, if the grounding issues, if it, is, is it gonna interfere with other people, is it gonna be a trip hazard, yada, yada, yada. So, we're gonna talk to them about it. Uh, promotional materials we could have done a better job with. I brought two boxes of QSTs, and I think I still got two full boxes because nobody was giving them out. Seriously? <laughs> Take them. Um, yeah, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so, yeah, it was quite the job. But bottom line is it was a humongous success. And I'll tell you, you want to you want to see some uh, some real smart kids. You know, there's one right there. That guy there. He, I think he put three of us under it, it, no problem. He's just so darn smart. There's another kid there. Um, last year he was a speaker at uh, um, Marlboro. Last year, uh, Max. It's uh, him on the end. But, you know, all these kids, I mean, it's, they're, so, they're so darn smart. It's, it, it just blows your mind. And some of these questions were really good. But uh, Gene was really happy about it. Uh, everything fell into place nicely. Uh, it was uh, quite the huge success overall. This year, I don't, I don't believe we're going to have another space station contact. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, uh, we had difficulties trying to get a hold of the, uh, uh, the management staff to see if what they want to do and what they can do for us um, because probably they had other events that were going on at the same time. And the other thing, too, is that, you know, you've got people around the world that are trying to get this event for their schools and their events and all that. If they see that we're doing it once a year, that may cause a little bit of a conflict and an issue and, some people are going to say, hey, what's up with this? So I don't know what we're going to do as far as a big event like this. We may just lay low and see what happens. So we are currently planning right now. We got a, I got a meeting on the 25th to start uh, kicking off our planning sessions as to what we're going to do uh, for this year. Now, the event, like I said, we've got the day before and the day after the event. That's our setup and takedown days. And then we've got the days in between. The event runs from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. And what we did is we basically, uh, this last year we had four people man the event for six hours. So we had a morning shift and a afternoon slash evening shift. And we found that four was probably too many. We could easily do it with three. Weekends, we'll have to bump it up to four. Um, and basically, this is a good thing for the clubs. Because, you know, clubs like yourself, Montachusett, you know, all clubs around New England, you know, if you get you know, four or five guys that you want to take and you want to get together and go up and man the Big E for a day, bring your club banner. We'll slap that thing right up there. You can bring your promotional materials or whatever. You could promote your club. So not only are you demonstrating and promoting ham radio, but you're also, you know, you're going to get hopefully some <coughs> visitors that are going to be interested in your own club. Therefore, you're going to, you know, increase your, hopefully, your attendance and uh, membership. So, again, a million and a half people are walking by there. 
you know, it's, it's almost kind of like a no brainer. I mean, it's like, yeah, got to give it a try. So if you guys want to take a volunteer, W1AST at ARRL.net. That's Larry. Or you could go to this link, and I believe, Jim, you're going to have uh, the slides. So the link is right there. Certainly, well, you could click on that. Also be in the description. Yep. So, um, yeah, just click on the link, and it'll bring you to a sign-up page, and uh, there'll be a selection of dates that are probably out there and available for you to uh, make a selection with. What we did, and this is why we wanted to take and keep things on the cheap, is that for those that are were coming, what we were doing was we were providing um, admission and the parking for free. We would reimburse for that. So that's that's what we were doing for them. <clears throat> I believe the first day, the opening day of the event, uh, anybody that's a military member was getting in for free anyway. Well, we would like to get at least three per shift. So you're looking at a half a dozen people per day. And uh, it wouldn't be the first time that I've actually taken, gone up there, you know, of an evening, and then had to be back there the next morning because we were short. So me and Larry were basically, it was like me, Larry, and a couple of other guys. We kind of just kept things stable by just being available for all the um, spots that were open. So, yeah, so... Thanks very much for having me once again. That pretty much wraps it up. Um, yeah, if you've got any questions, you know, you can wake up now and ask me. Uh, is there a recording of the event? Uh, it is on YouTube. Okay. Yep, it is on YouTube. So which days are the heaviest at the fair? The, the weekends, the weekends. Both, both Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, yeah, you, you're usually looking at uh, <laughs> almost double the crowd. On the weekends. So if they draw back some other to this space contact, how are you have any plans for them to draw the track type of thing? Well, that's the kind of hard to do. Yeah, it, it's a, it's hard to match. I mean one of the suggestions I made was doing a uh, blue contact, but we don't want China shooting us down. <laughs> um but yeah it um well, that's one thing that when we uh, do the kickoff meeting in uh, in a week, we're going to be talking about that. You know, we're going to. Uh, is Fred could certainly push for another space station contact. We may do something different, or we may just lay low and just kind of concentrate on efforts on just doing a better booth and you know getting more people interested in ham radio. Hard to say, you know, because these buildings here, you don't know how the grounds are and, you know, what kind of lawyers they have and how much they get paid. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, there could be some uh, legality issues. You know, I mean, is the building maintenance done by union help, which means we would have to contract union help. So I, I really don't know. I'd like to have that answer. One guy actually tried to put up some... Uh, kind of a wire antenna inside there, and, yeah, basically it was useless. Inside. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't happening. I mean, right behind where the tower was, behind our um, our backdrop, you know, you look up and there's big air ducts. It's like, oh, yeah, that's done. <laughs> now, if we can have some engineer find a way that we can load up those air ducts, we might have a chance. Anything else? It could be. I mean, we initially did get permission to put antennas up. Uh, and at the time, we were actually looking at probably putting up, uh, you know, like a, a G5 RV style dipole and also a tri-bander. But then, uh, yeah, it's, that started falling apart pretty quickly. Yeah. 
they have outside areas? Well, there's outside areas, but it's mostly the uh, for the vendors. Oh. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of vendors out there, the food vendors. You know, they could probably put us, you know, in another spot, but is the traffic going to be as, as good, especially if the weather is bad? You know, when the weather is bad, oh, yeah, guess where the people are coming? <laughs> yeah, they're coming in big time. Did you have to provide a, a report after the people who actually need all these resources? No. No. Um, I mean, as far as I know, they didn't. I mean, Gene Cassidy obviously was at the uh, space station. I mean, that could have been a big enough, uh, you know, thing for them. And we approached them again for the booth this year, and they said, yeah, no problem. Okay. So, yeah, they were pretty much very receptive to it without any uh, resistance. So, yeah, so now all we have to do is just come up with a nice, neat way of making a nice, attractive booth so that people can take and come up and say, here we are. Um, one of the downsides is, is that where the booth is, we're kind of in the corner. And so, like, if you go upstairs, there's a stairway there, there's a bar right there, and, of course, you know, this, uh, this is great for older people because on both sides of us is the bathrooms. <laughs> so, yeah, the old people love that one. Um, but, yeah, some people thought that that really wasn't a good location because the traffic really wasn't there. And my thinking is, is that, well... In some ways, it was good because you got a lot of these other ven vendors, like the one that was behind us. Um, they were doing a cooking demonstration. So naturally, you're sitting there listening to clattering of pots and pans. Um, and yeah, and some other people, you know, tend to get a little on the noisy side too. So it's a six and one half dozen in the other. It's like anything else. It's personal preference. So, yeah, so there's going to be a lot of talk in the next uh, week, and uh, we'll start getting things underway. And, but I would certainly encourage you, you know, give it a try. Come on down. Even if you want to come by yourself, let us know. Sign up. You know, you'll still get covered for the, uh, the parking and the uh, admission. What is the admission? Uh, Ten bucks for parking, and I think it was 15 for entrance. So it really isn't bad overall. But still, you know, if you want to come out and, you know, it's, for you guys, hour and a half ride, you know, that's, that's the challenge. I don't want to go that far. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I, I like to tell some of the people, if they think it's too far, do it a half a dozen times during the event in a... F, not, a, not an F, but uh, in a uh, Silverado 2500 that gets 12 and a half miles a gallon. All I was doing was going down uh, Mass Pike and I'm hearing slurp, slurp, slurp. Pretty much. Actually, it wasn't bad. I mean, I was only getting 10 miles with the trailer, which I thought it was going to be a lot worse. But fortunately, it wasn't as bad as I thought. So, anything else? All right, folks. Thank you.